Today we have a great honor, and you will see it's also a great pleasure to listen to one of the Nobel Prize laureates that uh, honored us with their presence at the ceremony of the opening of the International Year of Light. Professor Ahmed Zawail is one of those giants without whom there would be no progress in modern science, which was awarded by Nobel Prize. As we all know, Nobel Prizes are really given by exceptional, for exceptional achievements. But Professor Zeveil is also exceptional in many other aspects. He is a charismatic speaker. You will, you will experience this in a moment. He is very much engaged with his roots in Egypt. He is of Egyptian origin, uh, living in the States, very actively working to help a global uh, development of uh, peaceful thoughts and using science for peace. He became the first uh, United, uh, uh, United States envoy of President Obama to the Middle East. He also was recently nominated one of the members of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. It's really a great honor and pleasure to host him with us, Professor De Veil. The floor is yours. You are going to speak to us about light and life. Well, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be uh, uh, here today and to begin this series of uh, lectures. You heard quite a bit about the Nobel Prize, and there are five of us uh, here. And I thought I'd begin by telling you what happened when you get the Nobel Prize. In 1999, it was announced for me and uh, there is a magazine very distinguished called Physics World, wrote about our work, because I bridge areas between chemistry and physics. And they got it right. What we did was my group and uh, why the Nobel Committee decided to give us the award. But then they went on after that to say, the whale was born in Egypt in 1496. <laughs> and so I was, I was so glad to uh, see that soon as Van Berg here uh, waited 500 years in order to give me the Nobel Prize here. <clears throat> what I'm going to talk to you about is an overview of light and life, celebrating this great year at UNESCO. So it is clear to all of us here that light is an essential ingredient from the universe's beginning to our world of today. This is a, <clears throat> an interesting slide showing the evolution of our universe from the Big Bang I hope I can get the, uh, uh, here, the, see, from the Big Bang here, all the way until the evolution of ourselves and the creation of planets and we on the planet. One thing is very clear. Every time you see a yellow wave, this is what we'll call photons or light. So from 14 billion years on, we can see that light is part of our, not only of our life, but of the entire universe evolution. For this reason, 
these uh, two uh, people were awarded uh, the Nobel Prize because you could see evidence or remnant of this, of this light as early as possible from the Big Bang. And I'm sure you will hear from my colleagues about this in more uh, details. So whether you're talking about time scale or you're talking about a length scale in the universe, and you will see some more examples of this from the Big Bang to the molecule that allow you now to see me as I speak, uh, in all of this, light is central to the process. So imagine with few examples that you probably know about, but I will re-emphasize. Imagine life without light. First is the sunlight. Sunlight, in simple words, provide you with food, atmosphere, and the energy. Many other things, but to simplify it, we have the food, the atmosphere, and the energy. This is a process that you heard about called photosynthesis. But I want to emphasize here there is a chemical process that is so essential that if you take carbon dioxide here and you have water, forget about the six and all of that, this is a molecule carbon dioxide, there is water, and you shine some light, you create sugar plus oxygen. So the carbon dioxide that we exhale, if it's mixed with water in the presence of light, it gives us the food that we need plus the oxygen that we can inhale. A process, it may appear simple, but it has taken billions and billions of dollars for research, and we cannot fully reproduce it. And there is a cycle here for this going from the carbon dioxide to the sugar called the uh, Calvin cycle. And for it, uh, Melvin Calvin uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize. Imagine also that we don't have Mr. Edison discovery of the light bulb. Just imagine that. So we're going from the candles and gas lamps into the light bulbs. And uh, <clears throat> this is what we see uh, for our own civilization. If there was no sun, and that's a remarkable thing for how we see, and I'll get to this a little bit, for our vision, if there is no sun, we'll be blind because of the fact that light, as it gets into the eye, interact with this protein. And there is a molecule in this protein called the rhodopsin, which as it twists, as it just changes the shape, as you can see, then with a process that's initiated with the light, you can see me today with very high efficiency, even if I dimmed the whole uh, auditorium. We wouldn't have synthesis of vitamin D if it wasn't for the light. Light goes through your skin, the yellow arrow, and then you make vitamin D, which actually regulates the calcium in our body. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible process in its complexity uh, that if you know more about it, you realize we cannot live for even minutes without this process. So what is light? It's a big question. What is light? So first, I'll highlight a few things uh, over a millennia. Many of the ancient civilization, the Chinese, the Buddhist, the Hindus, the, uh, also in all faiths, uh, the Jewish faith, the is Islamic faith, the uh, Christian faith, light comes in, but I just highlight uh, the theology, probably the first, that's known 
to mankind, which is Mr. Ikhnaten. Here shown, Ikhnaten was Nefertiti, and they worshiping the sun, and this is the first time that actually we had a monotheistic religion in the world of today. Now, <clears throat> I'm getting into the Islamic golden age simply because to highlight few things uh, in view of the very unfortunate and tragic event in uh, Paris. It is remarkable that during the Islamic golden age, uh, from the 8th century to the 13th century. These are just a few of the giants of the time. Philosophers, chemists, doctors, physicists. You notice here, for example, you, maybe some names that you will not recognize. But for example, algorithm, which is known as al khawarizmi uh, in the whole area of the Arab and Persian area. Algorithm is where actually this name, al khawarizmi is behind the name, algorithms of today. Of today. Uh, Averroes, Ibn Rushd, one of the great thinkers in uh, South Spain at the time. So this was truly the golden age of philosophy, of physics, of science, and the like. Today, I'll just say a few things about El Hazen, or Hassan ibn al Haytham. You heard about him briefly, but I want to show you a few experiments that he did, and actually some scholarly work that has been published about him. I also pointed out here at the end, Moses uh, Maimonides, this was in South Spain. He is from Jewish origin. And I just want to point out that there wasn't the conflict of religion and conflict of civilizations and all of that that we are seeing, unfortunately, today. So here is Ibn al-Hassan ibn al-Haysam, or al hazin And I'm pointing out just a few important things that he did. <clears throat> First, the Book of Optics, or Kitab al-Manazir. Second, the visual perception. Third, the camera obscura. All of the cameras we have today, the initial concept that, at least in the scholarly work that's known, is by al hazin And then he was a very interesting man when it came to uh, uh, philosophy and his opinion about uh, reason and how to reason. <clears throat> and by the way, he, <laughs> he claimed the madness at one point in Cairo because he promised the, uh, the ruler at the time that he can solve the problem of the dam near Aswan. And uh, when he failed, uh, the story goes, uh, that the ruler put him in jail and then he had to claim madness and he was released after the ruler uh, died. But that's a story. I don't know if it's uh, true. But this is very important here because <clears throat> this shows that in 1600, in, a, in 1600, uh, the two that were considered giants in reasoning and experimentation was uh, El Hazen on the left here and Galileo with his telescope on the right. We all in the modern world respect Galileo and we know of his experiments. But I thought this was very uh, important. It's actually uh, pointed out by Sabra. Sabra is a, uh, you can look it up, is a very distinguished historian and professor at Harvard. Uh, who died uh, recently. And so <clears throat> the books that's known very well is the optics of Ibn al Haysam, uh, inside the camera obscura, and of course the issue of the vision that I wish to tell you about. So prior to 
Il Hazen or Ibn al Haysan, the theory was that we emit light from our eyes and that's how we see uh, each other. Al Ibn al Haysan was the first to point out that actually the light come in reflected <clears throat> from the object like a tree and then get into our eyes and that's how we can see. And this, is, I think, is a paradigm shift in the definition of the modern language of uh, science. His idea of camera obscura was brilliant. Uh, <clears throat> the one on the right, if you can see it here, it's a candle, it's a group of candles, and there is a pinhole here, and the light goes through the pinhole and get uh, into a screen. And of course, he showed that the image get inverted on the screen. Uh, the other representation here, you will see, I think, in the afternoon uh, in more detail. So this is really the origin of the idea of the camera. Uh, because the image get inverted, and uh, there is implication here that the light, of course, is going in a straight uh, lines, and that's why you get an inverted uh, image. And this, according to Sabra, had a major impact on the thinking of uh, Descartes. So <clears throat> the transition then went to Europe, because it doesn't stay all the time as uh, was pointed out in the morning, uh, things change. And the transition went to Europe actually in the age of enlightenment and also the scientific uh, revolution. And in my office, <clears throat> there is an interesting uh, uh, picture that was given to me, uh, which say Einstein here, and he say, for the rest of my life, I want to reflect on what light is, even Einstein is asking the question, what light is? And obviously we start with Isaac Newton who thought that the light is a very tiny uh, particles and the famous experiment that he did to resolve the colors using a, a, a prism. So that was Newton's view of what light uh, is. Then after that, in the about 1670s uh, to the 18s, uh, uh, early 1800s, we had the wave hypothesis. So it's only, not only small particles, but we also have the wave hypothesis. People like Huygens and Fresnel. And this is a brilliant experiment. I think it's one of the most beautiful experiments uh, in physics in all of history, one of them. And uh, this experiment was done by Thomas Young, uh, who, by the way, was also Egyptologist. Uh, and uh, Thomas Young showed the interference of light. And this is a series of his lectures. And I'm, so, I'm sure uh, <clears throat> you will hear more about uh, this. So he showed if there is light going behind one pinhole uh, we get the normal pattern of light as you see it, but if we have two pinholes instead of one, uh, then you get this interference between the waves that are coming out from these two pinholes. A beautiful experiment that had a huge impact on physics and the related uh, area. And <clears throat> in the... Uh, I think one of the, again, most remarkable uh, development was by uh, James Clerk Maxwell, who told us that light is an electromagnetic wave. That means it has an electric field and it has a magnetic field propagating. And of course, he predicted what will be the propagation speed, which nowadays we call it the speed of light. And as such, Maxwell, I think he's a giant, Maxwell defined for us the entire electromagnetic radiation from the radio wave all the way to the uh, gamma radiation, different frequencies and different energies. Until 
Mr. Blank, Max Blank, defined what's called the quantization, and Einstein, of course, told us that the light that we see is bundles of energies that are coming at certain frequency, and the energy and frequency are related by what nowadays we call Planck's uh, uh, constant. Here in France, so some people said light is wave, some said that light is particles. Then Mr. Uh, de Broglie here, in his PhD thesis, pointed out that actually the two are related and light as a particle can be associated with a wave or even an electron with a certain mass can have a certain wave, and this was fundamental for which he received the Nobel uh, uh, Prize. So from this all and the nature of light, then came in the 50s and 60s what we call coherent light. This is a new type of uh, light which generated to us new properties that we have not seen before. Properties that can, you can make light in pulses, picosecond, which is a, a millions of a millions of a second, femtosecond is a millions of a billions of a second, autosecond, a billions of a billions of a second. You can generate ultra intense light. You will hear from Gerard de Moreau, this is light really at the limit, huge amount of intensity that you could put in these pulses, and you can create ultra-pure frequency, light that have very well-defined frequency for utilization in many things. This coherent light uh, was credited for this uh, three gentlemen, which you heard about already, and the Nobel Prize was uh, awarded uh, for them. The first laser was the ruby laser, uh, which was made by Maimon, and uh, as you can see here, this is the ruby uh, rod. And in fact, we celebrated the, uh, the 50, uh, laser at 50, here at the Louvre, and uh, Professor Gerard Moreau was the chairman, and we had a great time here in the City of Light a couple of years ago. I just want to point out that here is Nico Bloombergen, here is uh, uh, Cohen Tanuji, and uh, here is a Charles uh, Towns, and many others were at this uh, celebration. My colleagues here will be talking to you about different things with this coherent uh, light. You will hear quite a bit from uh, Bill Phillips, uh, <clears throat> Claude Cointanuji is not here, and Steve is going to talk about energy, not about cooling and trapping of atoms. But you can use these lasers to cool them down into micro and nano Kelvin, and you can also trap uh, them. You will hear also about communication of the electronics and the integrated circuits, and this is important work. And you will hear from Serge uh, Harouche about nowadays our ability to uh, manipulate an individual quantum state uh, of light or of matter. Our own work that I want to share with you a little bit, some excitement that we are doing. You know, some, sometimes people think that after the Nobel Prize you go to sleep. But I just want to tell you a few things that we are doing. Uh, <clears throat> this was the old field that we, uh, for which we received the uh, Nobel Prize called femtochemistry and femtobiology. And it had many, many uh, applications. But <clears throat> We wanted really to not only to look at events that's happening in time, and that's what we, uh, was the work that we did before. We wanted to look at space and time. We wanted to see objects and shapes, but this has to be in the microscopic world uh, of atoms and uh, molecules. So <clears throat> if you look at uh, very famous experiment that was done here in this country, uh, the mystery of a falling cat. If you have a cat, but don't do this experiment. But if you hold the experiment, if you hold the cat upside down and you let it go under the effect of gravity, 
it lands beautifully in its four feet. In other words, it doesn't uh, move with the same uh, shape. And uh, this was a very interesting problem that people wanted to take a snapshot of this process. And uh, uh, Marie was the first one to develop a technique that I don't have time to talk about, that you can take a snapshot of the cat as it's falling down to prove this idea. And in fact, see? Now we know that it can land. It lands beautifully on its feet. So how can you uh, do this? The cat, you see it with your eye. Mr. Marie saw the cat with his eye, but he timed it right. So he had the time, and the shape he can see with the eye. In our case, if we study materials, we can't. can't see it with our eye because the scale of distance is nanometer. It's a billionth of a meter. And the scale of time scale is the uh, femtoseconds. We wanted both the space and the time. And so for this, we had to break boundaries by making electrons out of light. So we used light to create electrons. And this is a, a tabletop at Caltech that we can do. We don't do the other techniques which going into the very short wavelengths and building big facilities like the synchrotron. And so the uh, electron microscope is well known. And in fact, it's 1930 was developed and it was awarded the Nobel Prize here, uh, Mr. Ruska, who did the first electron microscope which allow you to see now an object uh, that is extremely small, nanometer or so. So, but it didn't allow you to see motion of this object. And uh, that is, was our development uh, over the last 10 years, by which now we can make the electron microscope not only to see the object in space, but also to be able to see the dynamics of the motion itself. And this is an example of how it works. So the light pulse uh, propagates, and then it, we split this by a variety of ways, and uh, <clears throat> it goes into what we call a photocathode to create an electron uh, pulse, and then they meet again at the specimen, and as a result of this, we can see an image of a nanometer scale, but now we can take snapshots as a function of time for this object. So we have now about 10 orders of magnitude increase in the time resolution and the atomic, maintaining the atomic spatial resolution of the material. We published quite a bit since 2001, uh, not quite a bit, but in a variety of uh, directions and applications. And I just want to share with you, for example, a few things. So you can do nowadays, you can do nowadays nano structures, like a nano arm that uh, you can move. And <clears throat> this is actually in a real dynamical laboratory experiment where this nano structure now have a, an arm extending and it's moving in three uh, dimensions. Please note that this is one over a billions of a meter here. Uh, we played also with other things, like for example, musical uh, system. Uh, this is a nano piano, and this is a nano harp. It's very nice music, you see, but it's on the nano scale. You can see it with your eye. Uh, you can do. This is the piano instead of the harp. And we did something that's interesting. We can control the uh, melody itself by giving a sequence of certain pulses. And then we can have only one of the keys to play. So we have fun. We can do music. And uh, that's what the National Science Foundation is supporting us for here. We can also uh, 
We can also go into the biological world, and we have done that. This is a cell. This is a bacterial cell in front of you, but this is a whole cell, unstained, and now we're seeing the cell boundaries using a technique called the penum, uh, which we published uh, <clears throat> recently in, in Nature. And uh, you can light it up. You can see all the membrane of that cell as a function of time in terms of the field that we have generated as a result of the interaction between the electron and the light itself. This is a very recent experiment. We all probably, if we live to 100, uh, we will get Alzheimer. And uh, there is a claim, and it's by very distinguished uh, scientists in Cambridge, uh, that the reason for the Alzheimer that you form amyloids. Amyloids are almost a chain of this uh, protein. And there is a very important question. How stiff are these amyloids? If they are very stiff, they can influence our cells and uh, prevent the communication, if you like, between the neurons. And as a result, we lose our uh, memory. So we did experiments with this four-dimension techniques to actually get how stiff uh, these amyloids. And in fact, it's uh, remarkably uh, stiff and they aggregate uh, to a large extent and a lot of research now is going about can you uh, generate some drugs actually that prevent this uh, from happening. If you are interested, there is a very recent book we published about a month ago about our effort in this four dimension uh, visualization. <clears throat> Now, we couldn't have done this without all these people, and you would not recognize this, but I just wanted you to know that I haven't done this work. There are so many people that are involved in such research uh, activity. So, then I want to ask you the question, two questions I'm going to ask in the end of my talk, and that is light and the future of civilization. That's one question I want to ask. And we have challenges here. Uh, we have challenges in, the, in medicine and biology, understanding, diagnosis, and, and curing. We have a challenge in alternative clean energy, you will hear about. We have a challenges in global warming. We have a challenge in water. Water is going to be a very serious problem. We don't talk about this usually. We only talk about energy, but water is a very serious problem, and so is food and population. And the exciting new development in, in nanomachines. Nowadays, people are designing nanomachines that you will see that have unique function into ourselves. And finally, the thing that I think is very exciting is also space exploration and information technology and communication. So I'll just give you a, a quick review. First, there is a field now called physical biology, which combines physics ideas into biology, trying to understand, if you understand atoms and molecules, can you predict what a cell will do or an organ will do? We are far from that. We know body in biology will claim that nowadays there is a lot of work and it's very exciting, but we are not there yet. Uh, medical development. I give an example, for example, from the work of uh, Katrina and Suna Lund, and tremendous amount of work has been done about using lasers uh, in medicine and in a variety of, uh, of areas. Alternative energy. Here is a reference I give, and I guess he will talk more about this. But a lot of effort now about the solar energy, especially in countries, for example, like in Egypt. I mean, the sun is almost the whole day is there, and we should exploit this. There's also the talk about artificial leaf. In other words, mimicking photosynthesis. Can we mimic photosynthesis? Until now, 
We haven't been uh, successful, but lots of research is going on in this alternative area. Global warming, sadly, lots of politicians don't believe in it yet. And uh, it's remarkable that about three days ago in the New York Times, uh, it pointed out that the year 2014 is the hottest year in the history of mankind. And yet, still, some people don't believe in such thing. There is the nano micro scale machines. Uh, and this, to assemble from first pl principles, that's the idea of getting the atoms. Like, for example, this machine here you're seeing of ribosome, which is synthesized in our cells the proteins that we need. Can we make this from first principles? Can we make a cell, even a bacterial cell, from first principle? These are very exciting and challenging uh, problems. 1980, I wrote a, uh, a piece in Physics Today saying it may be one day that we can control a chemical bomb. Believe it or not, this nowadays is crucial in something called monoclonal antibodies. Meaning that if you can get an antibody to be selectively going, say, into a cancer cell at a particular antigen, you made a breakthrough for hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people. That selectivity and control is not there yet fully. Uh, information technology and the communication, of course, it's now between cities and uh, cell phones and everything. But I had the honor with my wife, Dima, who's in the audience, uh, to be part of this uh, going to space exploration at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. And we saw the uh, Mars Spirit. And uh, <clears throat> the communication between the Mars Spirit on Mars and we sitting on the ground was 15 minutes. In other words, you send a picture from Mars and we receive it after 15 minutes. This opens up a whole new way of uh, communication. And I also was uh, present at the latest Curiosity landing. And I just want to share with you a small movie that really shows that this is an incredible achievement in the 21st uh, century. And I hope we will continue to funding such ideas. This is a whole Mars Science Laboratory that was landed on Mars. Coming with it, this is a, a one ton, one ton laboratory that's entering Mars and coming from a huge speed into zero speed to land on a particular site. This, is, this makes all of us proud in science and the engineering, I should say. Uh, and uh, it's certainly something uh, that I consider breakthrough. It's just the art to think that you can land at a specific site on Mars. And that's prompted me to write an, an opinion piece to the Los Angeles Times uh, about how curiosity type research can create big stuff, like that curiosity uh, laboratory that you have seen, and that we should not be thinking about managing the research as we usually try to do. I want to show you my own curiosity in the, uh, in the bedroom. I was trying to have a test tube, have a piece of wood, and I was burning with a, an oil lamp that uh, in Arabic culture we make coffee this way by an oil lamp. And then I was burning this, and I wanted to see as a young 
boy uh, some gases that condense here on this uh, water. And so when I did that, my mother was very happy because she saw me experimenting with some nice experiment until she saw the flame coming in and uh, because I was actually burning this gas and she really was very unhappy actually. <laughs> So this is curiosity. This is to play with things and to find out really what's exciting. I want to, this is the other question I, I'm going to raise about light in politics. And here I'm using light uh, to enlightenment of our minds nowadays, which I'm concerned about. I have been very much concerned about science for the half knots uh, for decades now. And recently, also science for the halves, because I'm seeing the halves are very comfortable and they don't want to support science as it used to be. So I believe a better world perhaps is what I call my three A's. First, we have to elevate the not knowing. This is a huge population in the world of today out of the seven billion. So <clears throat> my belief is that education and science, especially education. And so we spend a lot of money giving F-16 and planes and tanks and all of that stuff. If you take two, three F-16s, you can make huge effect on education of the world. Second, <clears throat> alleviating the not having there are so many who are living on less than one dollar a day in our world. And we give AIDS, and people give AIDS, but it's political AIDS. And I hope that we can have the aid with partnership to help these people achieve a better status. Third is elevating the not free and uh, helping liberty and justice by being consistent, by not saying one thing and using another for politics in order to do that. And I believe that all can be done. People say it's complex and it's very difficult. I know it's complex and very difficult. Everything is complex and difficult in life. But if we are serious about it, we can make a real impact. We need dialogues, not conflict. And we need vision and leadership leadership and vision, which we are not seeing nowadays in our world, not hegemony. That's, that's the key. We need really people of vision and leadership to understand the impact of this on our world. And that's why I have put some effort in my uh, mother country, Egypt, over the last almost 15 years to build some science and education base and uh, the government called it uh, the Wales City. We have now a city for science and uh, technology. And it's made, it's a national project, and it's made of university, uh, research institutes, a technology pyramid to allow us to transfer the science into uh, products. We have also a center for strategic, strategic studies in order to connect with the rest of the world. And a high school academy for those who are uh, gifted. So I'm going to end by saying that space-time of our world is truly progress and peace in the year of light and beyond. And let's all enjoy life. Thank you so much.